Well, I'd like to begin, and we've given a handout to you all so that you can follow along. I've been to many conferences as a participant and as a speaker, and I know so many times you hear the speaker say things and you wonder, where did they get that from? Where is that quote? So I like to give you something to look at so you know I'm not just making stuff up. Okay? Like I just made up that prayer. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, so why don't we uh, begin by looking at the Gospel of John, chapter 15. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that bears no fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already made clean by the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides, or we could translate, translate that, he who remains in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can only do a few good things. No, that's not what he says. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Do we really believe that? Prayer is not a option. It's not an optional activity for us as Catholics. Jesus explains that without him, we can do nothing. And yet so often in our daily life, we find other things to do instead of praying. And oftentimes that, I believe, is because we don't fully understand what it is we're entering into in prayer. I think oftentimes we misprioritize because we forget that when we pray, ultimately, it is God who is working within us. We often reduce prayer to just another one of the things I need to do. And you know, we always find excuses not to pray. Think about it. You go to the Blessed Sacrament Chapel, you sit down with your Bible, or you sit down for your prayer time, and all of a sudden, all of the activities that you need to get done in that day come to your mind, like, and they overwhelm you like a flood. As soon as you sit down to pray, you think of all the other things that you need to accomplish. Johnny is moving, and he needs some boxes. Freddy is sick in the hospital, and you really need to visit him. Your mom, or your daughter, or your uncle, or your aunt, or some person you haven't spoken to in 15 years is all of a sudden needing a phone call from you. All of a sudden, we are flooded with all of these responsibilities, and we very quickly fall into the temptation of moving on from prayer. And not really and properly spending time in prayer and doing the kind of fruitful prayer that is really necessary. If we go through a whole day and spend no quality time in prayer, basically what we tell God that day is, I didn't need you. Every day we neglect prayer every time. We put off prayer to accomplish something else. We are essentially telling God, get out of my way. I got something better to do. Or perhaps we pray like this. Dear God, I have so many important things to do today. I am so important. I know that if I don't get these things done, then the world will go to hell in a handbasket. So please excuse me. I've got other things to do. Get out of my way. Amen. All right, we probably never say those words. But how often are we engaged in prayer and simply looking at the clock? We give God a time limit. Think about your favorite television show. You sit down and you watch your favorite television show, and at the end of the show you think, what, it's over already? Has it already been a half hour? 
And yet when you go to the Blessed Sacrament Chapel, you enter into prayer, or maybe you spend time at home praying. You spend some time in prayer. You sit down and you say, all right, that's it. This time I'm serious. I'm really going to devote myself to prayer. I'm really going to be focused. And you sit down and you start praying, and you're really into it, and you think, wow, I'm doing so well. Look at what a saint I've become. Look at how amazing I'm doing. I'm really meditating. I'm really penetrating into the mystery. How long have I been here? It must have been like an hour already. Five minutes. Okay. <laughs> we would rather do just about anything else other than pray. Let's see. What should I do? Should I spend a half hour in prayer or should I help Tom move a piano? I think I'd rather move the piano. We don't like prayer. And one of the reasons we don't like prayer is it involves mental work. And we don't like mental work. It's difficult. Ask somebody to multiply 35 times 7 in their head. You could do it. But I'd rather move some boxes instead. We dread mental work even over physical labor. And we all know how much we love physical labor. Right? Not very much. And so we have so many reasons to put off prayer, and yet the Catechism is insistent on the importance of prayer. Catechism 2744 quotes St. Alphonsus Liguori. Those who pray are certainly saved. Those who do not pray are certainly damned. That's putting things rather boldly. But there it is in the Catechism that is commissioned by Pope St. John Paul II. Now, if you're struggling with prayer, you're probably doing it right. If you're struggling with prayer, don't despair. Because uh, actually, St. Paul talked about how he struggled with prayer. Romans chapter 8, Paul says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. St. Paul says we don't know how to pray as we ought. Let that be a consolation to you. I remember uh, when I was a kid, I was uh, going to Catholic elementary school, and we would have morning mass one day a week. We would all get over there for mass as a class, and there'd always be these pious old ladies praying in the church. They were there before mass, they were there after mass. And I couldn't wrap my mind around what it was that they were doing all of this time. How do we pray like that. What, uh, nobody ever taught me the technique, the method, the process. What are you supposed to be doing? Well, we have to remember that really there isn't like a trick to praying first and foremost. Because St. Paul says, we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. Oftentimes prayer becomes a struggle for us because... We think it's something that we do, and that we do alone. We imagine that prayer is another task that I must get done. And so, many times, we become overwhelmed with the burden, the, the perceived burden of prayer. We often feel that way because we're thinking of it in terms of a burden being placed simply on our, soul, so, on our shoulders. What we need to remember is prayer isn't simply a monologue, as Brant Petrie said earlier. It's a dialogue. And yet so often, this is not on our minds. St. Uh, Teresa of Avila answered the question, what is contemplative prayer? The Catechism gives her answer. Contemplative prayer, in my opinion, is nothing else than a close sharing between friends. It means taking time frequently to be alone with him who we know loves us. I love that line. Prayer is a conversation. Now, too often, we reduce prayer to a monologue. When I was young and I was wondering what those old ladies were doing in church, I seriously would think to myself, what are they praying for? Because in my young mind, I reduced prayer to a litany of things I wanted God to do for me. What is prayer? All right, it's time for prayer, right? All right, let's do that. We say it, Our Father, say Hail Mary, and then it looks like this. God bless this, and God bless that, 
and God help this person, and God help that person, and give me this, and give me that, and help nobody to find out that I did this, all right? And certainly don't let the consequences of my bad actions in this particular case affect me, help me to escape. And so prayer becomes a long litany of all the things that we want from God, as if God is our heavenly butler. And he's waiting around in heaven, and we show up in prayer, and he, he comes to us and he says, you rang? How may I help you, sir? Oh, a Ferrari. Yes, I think you deserve a Ferrari, sir. What color would you like? Red, and in the interior, leather, good choice. I'll get right on that. I'll see you at Mass on Sunday. So often, that's how we approach prayer. You hear people say things like, well, all we can do now is pray. Ever heard anybody say that before? Well, all we can do now is pray. Prayer is like a last resort. We tried everything else. Well, I guess now we just got to pray. What do you mean? Prayer is all we can do now is pray. What were you doing before? All we can ever do is rely on God. Now, the catechism gives us a beautiful explanation of how to pray well. And it, uh, it comes in the section where it's talking about major figures in the Bible and their example of prayer for us. We read in Catechism 2576, Moses' prayer is characteristic of contemplative prayer by which God's servant remains faithful to his mission. So Moses' prayer is characteristic of the kind of prayer that enables us to be faithful to our mission. What does that prayer look like? It says, Moses converses with God often and at length, climbing the mountain to hear and entreat him and coming down to the people to repeat the words of his God for their guidance. In order to pray well, we must do two things. We need to pray often, and we need to pray At length, right? We need both things. This is true of any relationship. If you want to maintain a relationship with any other person, you have to do two things. You have to speak to that other person often and at length. If you don't have one of those two elements, your relationship is going to be in a, a rather shallow one. So, for example, you need to pray often. We need to talk to people often in order to remain in touch. If you don't talk to someone often, what happens? Well, you get disconnected, and then you feel absent from their life. They feel absent from your life. And then you maybe ring them up or you meet with them in order to do what? To get caught up. Right? We need to talk to people often. You may have had great friends with people. You may, I'm sorry, you may have had great friendships with people in your childhood, people in high school or college, people when you lived in a certain town and maybe you moved away. But if you don't continue to talk often, then the relationship begins to weaken. But it's not just enough to talk often. You have to talk at length. You have to talk at a deep level. The conversations can't be small talk. We need to talk at length. We need long talk, right? So you may talk to someone often, but if you don't engage in a meaningful dialogue with them, you really don't have much of a relationship with them. Like you may have a next door neighbor who you see every Tuesday morning when you take out the garbage before you go to work. Every Tuesday morning, you're scrambling to get those barrels out and so is Fred. Hey Fred, how you doing? Good to see you. It's good to see you too, Michael. Get the first barrel. Nice weather we're having here, huh? Oh, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, I was just in Chicago last week. I was just in Steubenville last week. Yeah, I'm so glad. Weather is so nice this time of year here. Wonderful. Okay, go back. How are the kids? Oh, they're great. Did you have a birthday party last week? Saw some balloons? Yeah, okay. Go get one more barrel. You going to watch that big sports game this, this weekend? Yeah, I'm rooting for it. Yeah, so am I. All right. See you next Tuesday, and that's the extent of your relationship with Fred. 
if you don't talk about meaningful things, if you don't talk at length, the relationship will never grow. In order to have a meaningful relationship, we need to talk often and at length with people. And the same is true with God. We need to talk to God often. That means every day. That means we recognize apart from him, we can do nothing. We can never get through a whole day without spending time talking with God. But not just talking with him in brief. I don't mean praying between innings of a baseball game you're, you're watching on television. It's like, oh, well, it's a commercial break. Let me say Hail Mary. Okay. All right. I don't mean simply, you know, a brief prayer as you drive by a church. Although those things are important, we also need to talk at length with God every day. And so the spiritual writers of the church explain that you need at least 15 to 30 minutes every day in meditation. Dom Schutard, the author of The Soul of the Apostolate, a great spiritual work, explains if you don't spend at least 15 minutes in prayer every day, you will fall into mortal sin. It's not a possibility. It's inevitable. This is not enough to talk with God only in between innings of a baseball game. We need to talk with him often and at length. But how do you do that? How do you have a conversation with God? How do you enter into something more than just a monologue? How do we hear God speak to us? Because that is really the essence of a conversation. It's a two-way street. Brant alluded to this earlier. What kind of relationship can you have with someone who's never interested in listening to you? Not a very good one. You know people like this in your life, right? You see their name on the caller ID on your phone. Oh, it's Shirley. Uh, do I answer it? All right, you answer it. Hi, Shirley. And she just talks your ear off, and you're just waiting for her to take a breath. So you say, okay, I got to go now, bye. Right? What kind of relationship can you have with someone who's never really interested in what you have to say, but only interested in talking at you, not talking with you? We need to learn to talk with God, not simply at God. To treat him not like a butler or a genie, but as our loving Father. How do we hear God speaking to us? Well, I teach at a wonderful university in San Diego with a, a business program, and some of our entrepreneurial business program students have come up with a new device. They're trying to market it. They think there's a need out there. It's a little red phone, and you take it into the chapel with you, and if you're really holy, it might ring. No, I'm just kidding. No, 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 I'm teasing. How do you hear God speak to you? Is it like you go into the chapel and then you start hearing voices? Well, no. That's not the way it works. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that's not how it works, but most people don't know how it works exactly. How do we hear God speak to us? If it's not an audible voice, how can prayer be more than a dialogue if we're not hearing audible voices in prayer? Well, the Catechism and John Paul II and the Second Vatican Council and many other places explain that the way we hear God speak to us is in sacred scripture. Brandt had a beautiful quote this morning from the Catechism to this effect. Here's another one taken from the Second Vatican Council. In the sacred books, it says, the Father who is in heaven comes lovingly to meet his children and talks with them. In the sacred books, the Father who is in heaven comes lovingly to meet his children and talk with them. How would you like to have a conversation with God? I think all of us would like to be able to hear God say, hey, pull up a chair. I'd like to have a chat with you. How does that work? Now, most of the time in our spiritual life, as Catholics, we don't hear too much about the way this works. There are two means, principal means, by which we enter into this. One is Lexio Divina. Brant talked about that earlier. 
in Lexio Divina, we are focusing on the words of Scripture, reading prayerfully the words of Scripture, keeping in mind the words of St. Jerome. Ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. If you don't know the Bible, you can't know Jesus. It's just that simple. And so with that in mind, I'm always horrified when people say, oh yeah, don't you remember in, the, in you know, 2 Kings where it says that Elijah, whenever I hear somebody go into like maybe some of these more obscure passages of the, of the Old Testament, and whenever I hear something, I'm like, I don't remember that. These words of St. Jerome always ring in my mind. I don't know that passage. Does that mean I don't know Christ? At least I don't know him as well as I should. Ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Jesus Christ. We need to read Scripture, pray from Scripture. And in doing so, we can truly be transformed. I was uh, quite happy in our little pack packet for the speakers. They gave us all a little book. It's a gift. And this book is written by Father Michael Scanlon. It's called Appointment with God. This book changed my life. But I've never read it. This book changed my life because many years ago, there was a man named Derry Connolly, who, uh, Irish immigrant to the United States, got his PhD at MIT, grew up Catholic, raised his family Catholic. He had a daughter named Sarah, who always did exceptionally well in school. She excelled. And she was at the top of her class, graduated valedictorian, and she scored a near perfect on the SATs. She was accepted to all kinds of Ivy League schools. But Sarah, right before she decided where to go to college, went to a Steubenville Youth Conference. And her life was turned upside down. Now, her family had always gone to Mass on Sunday, but more, in a sense, out of duty than anything else. And Sarah wanted to come to Franciscan University to study. And her dad, who had a Ph.D. from MIT and taught at UCSD in San Diego and ran the business department there, which has seven Nobel, they have seven Nobel faculty, seven Nobel Prize winners on their faculty. All right. Derry was like, wait, what is this school? Franciscan University of where? Let me, let me explain the schools that I will help you go to. They're called Princeton, Harvard, all right? Maybe Duke, okay? Steubenville, that's not on the list. She said, Dad, Steubenville is an amazing place. I really want to go there. And he said, fine, look, we're going back east to look at a bunch of schools. While we're traveling around, we can drive through Steubenville. And so that's just what they did. And they came on campus, and they found out as part of the tour that they had a daily mass. And this was the first time Derry had ever heard of the concept of a daily mass. Well, actually, he heard of it, but he didn't think anybody actually went to it. He thought really only priests would celebrate that. And so they went to the chapel here, and it was jam-packed with teenagers. And he said, oh my goodness, what is going on here? These people must be ill. Don't they have anything else to do? It must be a boring town. All they got to do is go to Mass. And he was so overwhelmed, he didn't know what to make of all this. And so he went into the bookstore. And he said, well, I'm going to get a book. I'm going to, whatever is in the water here, I'm going to take a, a sip. And he said, I don't want anything long to read because I'm not going to give that much time to it. So what's the shortest book? Oh, it looks like this one, Appointment with God. And it's a book by Father Scanlon in which, in part, he talks about Lexio Divina. Well, Derry was overwhelmed by this idea that you could have a conversation with God by listening to him in Scripture. So he read this book while they were on campus. He took his Bible into the Portiuncula cha Chapel. And as he read it, he had this sense. It just came to him, this idea, 
that there needs to be a Catholic university like this in California. We need something like this on the West Coast. And he had the sense, I'm supposed to build it. And he said, yeah, right. No way. Yeah, what a ridiculous idea. So he struggled with this for a long time. But as soon as they went back, he said, well, I'm going to try that daily mass thing. And he went to daily mass. And afterward, he went to the chapel and took his Bible and read the Bible like Father Michael Scanlon said you could. And he encountered Jesus. And he said for the first time in his life, he realized what it meant to really enter into prayer. And Derry Connolly became the founder of the school that I teach at, John Paul the Great Catholic University in San Diego. And the school has now been around for, you know, seven years or so. And I have a job, <laughs> and the university is there all, of, all because Lexio Divina changed his life. But it wasn't just learning that you could hear God's voice in Lexio Divina. There's another way we hear God speaking to us in Scripture. And that's what I'd like to talk about for the remainder of the talk here. It is the rosary. We enter into a conversation with God in the rosary. We often struggle with prayer because we don't know how to do more than talk at God. And so because of that, many people really struggle with the rosary. As I said in my little commercial last night, you can often tell what mystery you're in by the altitude of people's heads in the rosary, right? First joyful mystery, second joyful mystery, third joyful mystery. <laughs> you know it. If you pray in a family, there's always a few people. And you, you know it's like, oh, yeah, we, we know we're in the second sorrowful mystery because Marty's snoring now, right? And by the time we get to the fourth, sure enough, somebody else will... I remember when I was a kid, if I had a hard time falling asleep, I was told, what, you're having a hard time falling asleep at night? You know what you should do? Pray the rosary. Because I defy you to stay awake for an entire rosary. Well, that's not what they said, but I always thought that was implied. It's humanly impossible to stay awake. Why? Well, because we often don't really understand what it is we're doing. When we pray the rosary, oftentimes we simply do it to get through the Hail Marys. We often do it like a horse race rosary. You know the horse race rosary? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is now. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. How fast can I say these Hail Marys so I can be done with it? That is not what the rosary is meant to be. Why is the rosary so powerful? Is it because it has so many Hail Marys? You say so many Hail Marys and God has to listen to you. No. What are we doing when we pray the rosary? Ultimately, what we're doing is meditating on Scripture. Pope St. John Paul II wrote a beautiful letter, and I highly recommend you read it in its entirety. It's available for free on the Vatican website. John Paul II said, The rosary though clearly Marian in character, is at heart a Christocentric prayer. In the sobriety of its elements, it is all the depth of the gospel message in its entirety, of which it can be said to be a compendium. The rosary is a compendium of the gospel. That's what John Paul II says. The rosary has all of the depth of the gospel. How? In the sobriety of its elements. By praying it slowly and carefully. Now, that means more than just saying the Hail Mary over and over and over again. John Paul II goes on. He says, the rosary precisely because it starts with Mary's own experience, the first joyful mystery, the Annunciation. In the rosary, we're meditating on the life of Christ through the eyes of Mary. He says, is an exquisitely contemplative prayer. Without the, this contemplative dimension, it would lose its meaning, as Pope Paul VI clearly pointed out. Paul VI says, Without contemplation, the rosary is a body without a soul. What's a body without a soul? What do you 
Yet when you separate the body and the soul, death. A body without a soul is a corpse. If you're praying the rosary and all you're doing is saying the Hail Marys, but you're not meditating on the gospel, then Paul VI and John Paul II says, you're praying a lifeless rosary. It's not enough to just say the words. There is an interior dimension of the rosary. He goes on to say, its recitation runs the risk of becoming a mechanical repetition of formulas in violation of the admonition of Christ, who said, in praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. The rosary is not a powerful prayer because it consists of many Hail Marys. No. The rosary is powerful because in it we are learning to hear our Father speak to us in the gospel, in the stories of Scripture. He goes on to say, by its nature, the recitation of the rosary calls for a quiet rhythm and a lingering pace, helping the individual to meditate on the mysteries of the Lord's life as seen through the eyes of her who was closest to the Lord. Notice what Pope St. John Paul II says here. The rosary is supposed to be done slowly. If you're praying the rosary in under 10 minutes, you're praying it too fast. The rosary is something we need to soak in. Something we need to reflect on. In fact, John Paul II just puts it simply this way. The rosary is simply a method of contemplation. The reason the rosary is so difficult for most people is that they simply say the words without entering into the mystery. And this is what I didn't get about those pious old ladies who prayed in the church where I went to Mass when I was a kid. They knew what I was ignorant of. And that is, when we pray the rosary, we're not just thinking about the beads. Hail Mary, full of grace. Hail Mary, full of grace. We're thinking about the stories in Scripture. But here's the problem. If you don't know the stories in Scripture, you can't pray the rosary well. If you don't know the stories in Scripture, you can't pray the rosary well. Why has literacy exploded since the rise of Christianity? Well, we're not a religion of a book, but we do recognize that God has inspired a book. And that gives us all the more reason to learn how to read. In fact, St. Teresa of Avila was famous for her reform of the Carmelites of her day. One of the things St. Teresa of Avila insisted is that no illiterate person could join the discalced Carmelites because it was such a charism for her order to meditate on reading Scripture. But, you know, we don't need to simply read the words. We know the stories from hearing them at Mass, from stained glass windows, from sacred art. There are so many ways to meditate on the rosary, to meditate on the stories in Scripture. We know what the m mysteries are, but for those, if there's anybody here who doesn't, I've put them on page two of the handout. Here you see a basic overview of what we're supposed to be thinking of during the rosary. Not long ago, I went to Society of Biblical Literature, which is the most prestigious gathering of biblical scholars all around the world. And uh, there's uh, a friend of mine, a guy I know, He's a blogger. I won't say who he is, but he is one of the most well-known Bible bloggers in the U.S. He has incredible traffic to his Bible blog, and he's not a Catholic. And so over time, I was sharing with him 
what the rosary is. That the rosary is learning how to think about, reflect on, meditate on the stories in Scripture. And so he was intrigued because he always thought that the rosary is nothing more than heaping up empty phrases. I'm going to say 50 Hail Marys, God has to hear my prayers. And so I went to Society of Biblical Literature a few years ago, and I saw him, and there were a bunch of scholars who were all standing around talking, and many of them were Protestant, and he's a pretty well-known Protestant. And so we're standing around talking, and he leans over to me quietly in this crowd, and he says, hey, I went to the Catholic mission here in San Diego. I said, you did? I said, I went to the mission. I said, the Catholic mission? Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Did you, did you enjoy it? Oh, it's something else. He says, but, um, and he's looking really awkward. He says, but they had a bookstore, and I didn't know where else to go, so I went to a bookstore at the, at the mission. I said, great. I mean, there are many books here. He said, yeah, and he pulls out of his pocket a rosary. He says, I got one of these. <laughs> and I said, that's fantastic. And he said, can you show me how to use it? <laughs> Absolutely. So the next morning, we got together at Society of Biblical Literature, all these snobby scholars. And we went off to the side behind a, a coffee trailer and we brought, took out our rosaries, and I said, all right, let me explain. Now, this one we're going to say in Our Father, and then these mean Hail Mary, and this is a glory be. And it was Sunday, and he said, well, you know, let's just, uh, he said, what do you do on Sunday? Is it a particular way to pray it? And Because it's Sunday, and I said, well, yeah, we'll do the glorious mysteries. Oh, so, great. So I'm thinking, okay, this will be good. Um, right, the first thing we do is we're going to meditate on the resurrection of Jesus. So for the next 10 Hail Marys, think about all the stories. You know them well about the resurrection and how Mary Magdalene saw Jesus. She didn't recognize him at first. And then when she saw him, she reached for him. Jesus said, don't cling to me. And there's so much we can think about here. But this is, you know, what we want to do during the next 10 Hail Marys. Don't just try to say the words. I know they're new to you. But don't just try to say the words. But really think about the story. And ask the Lord to speak to you through that story. And ask the Lord to show you how that story can be applied to your life today. Great, so we do the, the, first, the first glorious mystery. Then we get to the second glorious mystery, the ascension. Yeah, you know, Jesus is taken up into heaven. You know that story in Scripture too, right? And Acts, you know, chapter 1. And Yeah, okay, so let's think about that and how Jesus enters in, as Hebrews says, to the heavenly temple, offers himself as a sacrifice. Yeah, oh, yeah, sure. All right, so let's meditate on that. So we meditate on that. After, the, after that, Mr. Mike, what did you think about? There? And he shared and I shared. He said, this is really cool. And I said, this is what we do. This is how we do it. And we get to the third one, Pentecost. I'm like, hey, this is great. You know, we're plugging along here. You know, Acts chapter 2, right? And it, I mean, these are all just right from Scripture, right? This is great. Then we get to the fourth one, the Assumption. Okay, so this one, it's in the Bible, but kind of in a hidden way. Um, I say, you know, it's, um, well, it's kind of like the Ascension. Uh, it's, it's called the Assumption. And this is the understanding that at the end of her life, Mary was taken body and soul up into heaven. And I'm looking at him like he's going to hit me. And he said, no, I'm fine with all the Marian dog dogmas. Let's, that, that's good. I'm good with that. Let's go on. I, I believe it happened. It's fine. Okie dokie. And then he proceeded to tell me that he had been reading about the rosary and reading about the mysteries. And he came to see that it's really in the rosary that the fruit of all of his study can come together. He can learn all these things academically, but how do they get applied to your life unless you sit with them and meditate, them, uh, meditate on them? As the psalmist says, be still and know that I am the Lord. We don't want to be still. We want to move. We want to think. We want to, you know, go off and do other things. We don't like silence in our society. We want to fill up every spare minute with noise. You're in the car, turn on the radio. You get home, put the TV on in the background, you know. We don't want anything to be, quote-unquote, too quiet. One biblical scholar says there's a reason for that. He says, we are scared of the silence because we know that God will find us there. The rosary means making time, being silent, allowing God to encounter us. And of course, we could go through all the mysteries, the Annunciation, the Visitation, the Nativity. I mean, they're all really from Scripture. It's really the last two, the glorious mysteries, that are hard to find in Scripture, or at least they're not 
there in, in an explicit way necessarily, but they are certainly, you can certainly pray them, uh, you can certainly pray these mysteries with Scripture. Anybody who's gone through the Bible in Mary, any of you have been in that Bible study uh, of the St. Paul Center, you can attest to that. And so we could talk about the structure of the rosary, but really the problem is that so often we don't know how to pr pray the rosary well because we don't know the stories. And so we get easily distracted. Our Father who art in heaven, how, the first joyful mystery, the presentation of the child Jesus in the temple. Okay, our Father. Jesus, Mary, Joseph. They're in the temple. Hail Mary. And you're thinking, all right, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph presenting Jesus. What is that? It's kind of sounds strange, right? The presentation. It's like, now presenting the Messiah. Hello, my baby. Hello, my honey. Hello, my... That's not what it is, but what, they're presenting them somehow. They're, here is a baby, God. I mean, what do you... What is that? Hail, uh, Hail Mary, full of grace. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph is in the temple. No, they are in the temple. Because it's plural, you know, and is and are. You start thinking, yeah. Hail Mary. Yeah, Mrs. Lampert taught me that in second grade. You think to yourself, is, are. She was a nice lady. She's probably dead now. Hail Mary. She had blue hair. How does one have blue hair? Do you think that she looked in the mirror and thought every day, oh, that, that looks good. That looks normal. Hail Mary. I wonder where they buried her. Hail Mary. There's that cemetery next to that Catholic school I went to. It always smelled. Why did it smell so bad? They're probably burning bodies. Oh, that's gross. Hail Mary. And then glory be. What? We're done already? What happened? How did... And this is what happens when we pray the rosary. We get so easily distracted. Our mind is wandering all over the place. Why? Because we don't know the mystery well enough to think about it for a length of time. All we got, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph are in a temple. Okay. If you really want to enter into the mystery of the rosary, you have to do Bible study. Anybody who comes to ABS must be interested in doing Bible study. If you love Bible study, the rosary is the devotion for you. If you love the rosary, what you need to learn is Bible study. The two go hand in hand. But the reality is oftentimes we do not want to enter into that kind of study. This is a major problem. This is a major, major problem. Because the greatest commandment tells us that we need to do this. Jesus says in Matthew 22 what the greatest commandment is. The, the, the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees we read. They came together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your feelings. No, that's not what it says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. We must use our mind to love God. Now, in the spiritual life, we go through different stages. Matt Leonard, I think, gave a workshop today on that, perhaps. Uh, but all the saints basically explain the three ages of the spiritual life. That there are basically three ages. All of us go through these three ages. And St. Teresa of Avila describes it in, in her own way in the seven mansions. But it's basically three stages. St. Thomas Aquinas. I mean, they all explain it in terms of these three stages. And the three stages can be linked to this commandment. You shall love the Lord with all your heart. Now, when you first realize that you are a sinner, and you come to a profound understanding of who God is, you want to break away from your sinful life. And you immediately are filled with warm and consoling feelings in your heart. You go to confession, and it feels so good. Maybe some of you have been on a life-changing retreat. And you go on that retreat and you experience what many people call the retreat high. You're on cloud nine. It feels so good. 
you love the Lord with all your heart. And then over time, the feelings subside. And it's just like any relationship. If you love someone, you know, when you're first going out, you're filled with emotion. Everything that other person does is endearing. The way they tilt their head, the way they smile, the way they laugh. Everything is just so endearing. And you're filled, you swell with emotion at every little thing that they do. Over time, that subsides. Does that mean that your love subsides? Not necessarily. Your love deepens. And you learn not just to love with all your heart, but with all your soul. The soul is what animates the body. The soul is what gives you life. It's the principle of life. It's the core of who you are. And so you begin to better understand who you are in relationship with God and who you are in your essence. And in a relationship, over time, you come to a deeper understanding of what this other person is all about and who you are all about. And you grow in that knowledge. So you love God not just with all your heart, but with all your soul. And that involves your spiritual devotions. And you start to make, as part of who you are, Bible reading or certain kinds of novenas, certain kinds of spiritual practices and disciplines. But then there's one last element. Love the Lord with all your mind. Now, I mentioned earlier, we'd rather do anything than mental work. We'd much rather do physical labor over mental labor. What did Jesus call those who followed him? Disciples. What does it mean to be a disciple? The Greek word for disciple, mathetes, literally means learner, pupil, or student. And as I always have to remind my students at JP Catholic, because sometimes they forget. Do you know what students do? They study. That's what a student does. A student studies. All of us, as Christians, are called to study. It's not an option. Love the Lord with all of your mind. God gave us a mind, and he wants us to learn more about him. And Saint, so St. Jose Maria Escriva. See, in coming to this workshop, you're basically getting all the other workshops, right? I think John Bergsman was doing one on St. Jose Maria Escriva. Matt Leonard was doing one on the three ages of the spiritual life. Okay, I'm just trying to console you if you have buyer's remorse at this point. All right. St. Jose Maria Escriva says, you pray. You deny yourself. You work in a thousand apostolic activities. But you don't study. You are useless unless you change. Study is not an option for Christians. If we want to be able to pray the rosary, we need to study scripture. We need to understand its message. St. Jose Maria Escriva has another line. I love this line. He says, you frequent the sacraments. You pray. You are chaste. But you do not study. Don't tell me you're good. You're only good-ish. <laughs> study is not an option for a Christian. Because to be a disciple is to be a student. The more we study God's word, the more we will be enabled to pray God's word. The more we'll be able to hear God speaking to us. And so what I'd like to do now is really bring this talk to a close by focusing what we've learned here on a particular mystery of the rosary. It's the one I already mentioned. It's the one I think most people have the most difficult time understanding because most people really don't know what it's all about. The presentation of the child Jesus in the temple. What is going on here? Now, some people think that this mystery is about the circumcision of Jesus. That's incorrect. The presentation of the child Jesus is not about the circumcision of Jesus. It's about what came after the circumcision of Jesus. 
All right? For ancient Jews, when you had a child, if you were a woman, it was understood after birth, you had to go through a process of purification. This is not because you did something sinful. The purity laws in the Old Testament meant that you would often be rendered unclean by doing things you were commanded to do. For example, if someone dies, especially your parents, you must, you are obligated to bury them. But if you touch a corpse, you are ritually unclean. So why did God give Israel laws that would render them unclean? Well, clean, unclean, pure, impure wasn't necessarily about sin, although if you committed a bad sin, you could be rendered impure. But the imagery of pure and impure was all part of a larger symbolic system. And although it's complex and it's difficult to explain in all its uh, elements, there's a basic element that one scholar, Jacob Milgram, has highlighted. And that is that in the law, anything that's associated with death is unclean. And basically what God wants to teach Israel is that he is the God of life. That anything that is associated with death is ultimately in some way contrary to God's essence. Because God is not ultimately about death but life. So if you were sick, let's say you had leprosy, you would be unclean. What was leprosy? It's like you're decomposing while you're still alive. If you had a flow of blood, if you had a hemorrhage, you would be unclean. Why? It makes sense. If you lose a lot of blood, you can die. And so if a woman gave birth, she would be unclean. Not because it was a sin for a woman to have a child, far from it. God said, be fruitful and multiply. It's the first verse, I mean the first commandment in the whole Bible. By the way, we just had our fourth, which means we're finally keeping that commandment, you know, because up until now we were just adding, but now we have four, so we can, two and two. Okay, anyway, multiply. <laughs> Sorry. I told my wife, we have to have at least four, otherwise we're going to go to hell. No, I'm just kidding, no. So, if you had a flow of blood, you would be rendered ritually unclean. And after you had that flow of blood, you would go through a process of purification. That process of purification is described in the book of Leviticus. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, If a woman conceives and bears a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days. And on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. Then she shall continue for 33 days in the blood of her purification. So in the book of Leviticus, a woman is essentially unclean for 40 days after she bears a male child. Seven days, you have circumcision, and then 33 more days. And so in the book of Luke, we read about how Mary and Joseph were obedient to this element of the law. Luke chapter 2, verses 22 and following. And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Now this verse is jammed packed. Ten Hail Marys are not enough to think about this passage. Why do we have ten Hail Marys? Ten is common in the ancient world. You know, how many, how many commandments are in the Decalogue? Ten Commandments. Ten is frequent throughout the ancient world. Why? Because you have ten fingers, right? You can easily count to ten. It's not a problem. We, we, can, we can do that. We can keep track of ten things. Ten is an easy number for us. And so, to, you know, an easy number for us to keep track of. And so the reason we say ten Hail Marys for each mystery is not because, oh, once you get to ten, it's like some magic number, and now God has to give you whatever it was you were asking for. No. Basically, the idea is you should meditate on Scripture. How long should it take you to meditate on Scripture? Well, about as long as it takes you to say ten Hail Marys. It's a timing device. How long should I spend meditating on God's Word? Well, about the time it takes you to say ten Hail Marys. Now, you're saying the words, and your intention in saying the words is to ask the Blessed Mother to pray for you, but the goal is not to unpack the meaning of each Hail Mary. 
but to think about the mystery itself. And so, the first line of this passage has much for us to think about. Much fruit could be derived from just meditating on Luke 22, I'm sorry, Luke 2:22. Notice the way Luke describes what's going on here. The time came for their purification. Isn't that fascinating? Who is the one who has to be purified right now? Mary. But notice Luke doesn't want to imply that Mary is unclean. Mary, Luke has such a high view of Mary. If you know, if you've taken other courses or you've heard other talks here, you probably know Luke describes Mary as the Ark of the Covenant. Anybody ever heard that before? Okay, good. So Luke kind of describes Mary as the Ark of the Covenant. Luke doesn't like the idea that Mary would be described as unclean. So he says, when the time came for their purification. According to the law of Moses, they brought him to Jerusalem. Now, Mary and Joseph kept the law perfectly. So far, we've got a lot to think about. Number one, we can think about how holy Mary was. Secondly, we could think about the way Jesus and Joseph were participating in her purification. Third, we could think about how Mary and Joseph and Jesus obeyed the fullness of the law. If there was anybody in the New Testament who could say, you know, I don't think I need to be purified, other than Jesus, I think it would be Mary, the Ark of the Covenant. If anybody could say that law doesn't apply to me, it would be Mary. And yet Mary was obedient to every iota of the law. How often are we that faithful? Or might, I might put it another way. How often do we find excuses to, keep, to not keep the law? Oh, well, that's not really the sin of detraction. I really needed to tell that other person that gossip I heard. Well, that's not really the sin of detraction. That other person really needed to know what a jerk my next-door neighbor was. Oh, that wasn't really the sin of lust. It's not as bad as what other people do. Oh, that's not really the sin of anger. What the other person did was really unjust, and I'm just filled with righteous indignation like Jesus in the temple. Well, that wasn't really a lie if you think about it in this way. Well, I really had to do this because if I didn't, think about what the consequences would be. So it really wasn't a sin. We do this all the time. Well, if I can watch this television show it doesn't affect me the way it affects other people. I got to be rude to that other person. It's not really a sin because how else are they ever going to learn? I know I'm supposed to forgive other people, but not that person. They did something that was so bad. They could never be forgiven. We do it all the time. I know we're supposed to pray every day, but not me, not today. I've got this on my calendar. We, all, we find so many ways to exempt ourselves from the law of God, from the moral law. Mary and Joseph never sought a loophole. Furthermore, look at the word that's used here for the presentation. It says they brought the child Jesus to present him. Now, the word there is a stunning word. The Greek word that's used there is peristami. It's literally the word for sacrifice. Mary and Joseph are sacrificing Christ in the temple. Jesus came to offer himself as a sacrifice, and he did. He offered himself as a sacrifice on the cross. But before he offered himself on the cross, he offered himself as a sacrifice in the arms of his mother, even when he was an infant. We, too, must learn to offer ourselves as a sacrifice in the arms of the Blessed Mother. We must be like Christ. Christ sacrificed himself, or allowed himself to, to be killed, he offered himself as a sacrifice for us, but in the hands of his mother. So too, 
must we. And notice, it goes on to say, that they also offered a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of God, in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, if you go back to the Old Testament, you'll find that you were allowed to offer a pair of turtle doves, but only if you were among the poorest of the poor. That was the sacrifice for the people who had nothing more to give. Now, let me ask you a question. What happened to all Joseph's money? We know Joseph wasn't a homeless person. We know he wasn't a peasant. We know Joseph had a job. What was his job? He was a carpenter. The Greek word there for carpenter is tekton. It literally means like a contractor. I mean, it wasn't just like he was whittling stuff in his, you know, workshop. He was working on major building projects. I mean, he wasn't among the wealthy elite, but he certainly made a good living as a tecton. He was not one of the, you know, people at the very bottom rung of society. Joseph had a good job, and yet when he goes to the temple, he and Joseph offer turtle doves. What happened to all his money? I think there are only three options. Number one, Joseph was really poor with managing money. He was a bad businessman. I don't think that's the case. Number two, Joseph wasn't a poor businessman, but for whatever reason, he couldn't find work. But that seems unlikely because we know in Jesus' day, right next to Nazareth, there was a major city being built called Sephorus, right up in, in, near Galilee. And so Jesus, would, Jesus and Joseph would have had ample opportunity to work. So that doesn't seem likely. So the third option would be what? That Joseph gave his money away. The Gospel of Matthew says that Joseph was a righteous man. And the Greek word that's used there for righteous is the word that's typically associated with almsgiving in books like Tobit. Why did Joseph and Mary only have enough for two turtle doves? Because they gave everything else away. What do we keep for ourselves that we could give away to others? Something that we need to meditate on, especially in America, such a wealthy country. Do we really need that second television? Do we need, really need that extra pair of shoes that we have to own because if we don't have that pair of shoes, then we can't wear that one pair of pants that we never would wear otherwise. Do we really need a second car? Do we really need all the clothes in our drawers? Do we really need all the food that we get at the grocery store? We might reflect on this and think about how much more we could be putting in the collection basket on Sunday. How much more we could be giving to organizations that really need it. How much do we live off the fat of the land while people suffer? Mary and Joseph, I would, I would, I would suggest, gave away everything except what they needed to live. And in fact, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, don't worry about your needs for tomorrow. Don't hoard wealth. Don't, don't think you need to put all your money in a bank account because you never know. There could be a famine or, you know, something bad could happen to you and you're going to need, you know, $500,000 in the bank for who knows what might happen down the road. Don't trust in your bank account. Trust in the Lord. Jesus says, let today's worries be enough for you. Trust in your Father in heaven. Where did Jesus get that lesson? I would suggest he got that from St. Joseph. And we go on to read how Simeon was a righteous man and devout in the temple looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. 
And inspired by the Spirit, he came into the temple. And when the parents of Jesus brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared in the presence of all peoples. A light for the revelation to the Gentiles, for the glory to thy people Israel. In other words, the promise made to Simeon was finally fulfilled. Think about how God, during this mystery of the rosary, I mean, think about all the things you could do for ten Hail Marys. You could reflect on why Luke spoke of their purification instead of her purification. You could reflect on the way Jesus is offered as a sacrifice, how he offers himself in the arms of Mary. Jesus wants us to learn to offer ourselves up in the arms of Mary. Jesus offered himself as an infant. Do we ever make excuses? Do we say, I'm too weak, I'm too sick, I'm too poor, I'm too whatever to be offered, Lord? Jesus offered himself from the first moment of his life to the Father, to the last. We could think about how Mary and Joseph were poor, likely because they gave all their excess wealth to the poor. We could think about Simeon and how God has been faithful in his life. Or finally, we can think about the words Simeon addressed to Mary. Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising in many, of many in Israel, and for a sign that is spoken against, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that thoughts out of many hearts may be revealed. That last line is a little bit hard to understand, but suffice it to say, what Simeon is saying is that the work of redemption will only be accomplished with Mary's cooperation. A sword will pierce her own soul also. In fact, we know there was someone pierced at Calvary, but it wasn't Mary. According to John, it was Jesus. One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once came out blood and water. But Mary is so closely united to her son that she participates in that work. What is true of Jesus is true of her. As he was pierced, she was pierced. Are we willing to enter into that mystery of suffering? Or do we seek to avoid it? Is our prayer simply, Lord, deliver me from this terrible situation that I'm in. Fix my life. Allow me to live a, a life of nothing but rainbows and bunny rabbits. Take away all my suffering. Or do we ask to be like Mary and allow our souls to be pierced for the salvation of the world? Indeed, praying the rosary is so powerful, it can really be said to be an apostolic work. Praying the rosary is the first means of evangelization. Prayer it needs to be our first recourse. You know, I speak all over the country at, can at conferences and parishes. People always come up to me and they say, Dr. Barber, you know, I have a, a loved one, I have a family member, I have a neighbor an old friend who's fallen away from the church. What do I say? They're anti-Catholic. They've lost their faith. What do I say? And I always respond, the rosary. Because people are not going to experience the grace of conversion because you had the best comeback line, the most articulate defense of the Trinity, the most eloquent explanation of the book of Isaiah, it's going to be because of God's grace. Amen? And so, Dom, Don, Jean, oh, let me say that again. Dom Jean Baptiste Choutard, in the great work, The Soul of the Apostolate, writes A short but fervent prayer will usually do more to bring about a conversion than long discussions of fine speeches. He who prays is in touch with the first cause, he acts directly upon it. And by that very fact, he has his hand upon all the secondary causes, since they only receive their efficacy from this superior principle. And so the desired effect is obtained both more surely and more promptly. Never, ever, ever neglect prayer to do work of evangelization. That is the way the devil will destroy your soul. We have too many examples of well-known priests who have fallen away. There are too many examples of great teachers of the faith who have fallen away. Don't let your ministry 
become a trap for you. Dom Jean-Baptiste Choutard also puts it, says this, no one in this world knows the reason for the conversions of pagans at the ends of the earth. Why is it that some group of people never heard the gospel? You know, all of a sudden they embrace the gospel. I love watching the History Channel. Well, they have a lot of errors and stuff. But it's always funny, you know, they say, you know, here is medieval Europe, you know, and it had this religious group. And, and then the missionaries came. And it's like a foregone conclusion. And then they all became Christian. Okay, and that's the rest of their history, right? Like, Christianity just spreads everywhere. And it's not because of the sword, as in Islam. What, what is happening? Why are so many people converting? No one knows the, the reason for this, he says. No one knows the reason for the heroic endurance of Christians under persecution. How is it that Christians will allow themselves in history to be skinned alive for Christianity? I mean, even if they believe in God, you'd think that people would suspend belief long enough so that they could conveniently avoid such a fate. No one knows the reason for the heavenly joy of martyred missionaries. All this is invisibly bound up with the prayer of some humble, cloistered nun. Who is the patron saint of missionaries? Saint Teresa the Little Flower, who never left the confines of a cloister. Her fingers play upon the keyboard of divine forgiveness and of the eternal lights. Her silent and lonely soul presides over the salvation of souls and the conquests of the church. And then he quotes a bishop of Cochin, China, to the governor of Saigon, ten Carmelite nuns praying will be greater help to me than twenty missionaries preaching. Do we so value prayer? Prayer is difficult. But prayer can be made more fruitful through study. And there is no prayer that that is more true of than the rosary. Let us ask the Lord to enable us to pray the rosary more faithfully and more profoundly. So that our Bible study will not simply remain an academic activity. And so that our prayer will not simply be an empty ritual. But so that we can truly be empowered by the vine dresser, so that united with the vine, we can do far more than we could ever ask or think, as St. Paul says. Let us now turn to the Blessed Mother in prayer and ask for her intercession. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm sorry, I didn't leave much time for questions. Are there any questions that I could answer? Yes. Oh, that is a fantastic question. How do you know when it's God talking to you, and it's not yourself? That's a great question. Well, there's a great book. I'm not going to be able to answer this question and say everything I'd like to say. There's a great book by Thomas Dubay called Authenticity, a Biblical Theology of Discernment. And I highly recommend that book. But let me just point out a few things. Even St. Paul, after he had an experience of the risen Lord, after he encountered the risen Lord, after Jesus spoke to him directly, even St. Paul went to Jerusalem to meet with Peter. And he says in the book of Galatians that he did this lest he be running in vain. St. Paul understood that he had to subject his understanding of what God was telling him to the teaching of the church. And so number one, you know you can know that something is authentically from the Lord if it's consistent with the teaching of the church. Even St. Paul went to Peter, so should we. So we need to, you know, always make sure if, for example, I, I, I remember when I was in graduate school at Fuller, not a Catholic institution, I remember uh, young women told me, I feel called to the ministry. How could you tell me that women cannot be ordained? Right. Well, first of all, no one is worthy of ministry. Nobody is worthy of the ordained priesthood. The question is, who does God call? And one way to answer that is through your subjective experience in prayer. But that's not the only way to answer that. 
Christ also gave us a church, and we need to listen to the teaching of the church on that. All right? So we always need to subject our personal experience. Secondly, we hear God speaking to us in Scripture. So we can have his words in sacred Scripture. Now, sometimes it's possible in prayer to hear audible words. It does happen from time to time that the saints will have some kind of mystical experience. But you need to know that all of the saints who had those experiences understood that those experiences always need to be subjected to the authority of the church. And secondly, even the saints who experienced such things were always very suspicious. They would never um, put too much stock in those experiences. Do you know why? Because St. Uh, John says, even the devil can disguise himself as an angel of light. Right? So, we always want to be careful that if we get the sense that we're hearing voices or experiencing supernatural phenomena, that it's coming to us in the right way. Third, we never want to put too much stock in those experiences. St. John of the Cross, for example, says, if you, hear the Lord, if you have such an experience, pay no attention to it says. Why? Remember what Brandt said? We can become spiritual gluttons where we just pray for all the warm and fuzzy feelings. All right? So we hear the Lord speak to us. Okay, that's great, but let's not put too much, you know, we have to be cautious about the way we receive these kinds of things. Fourth, we want to make sure we have a good spiritual director. Someone that we can confide in. And it should be a priest who has experience. A priest who's been a confessor for a while. And a priest who understands spiritual theology. So, you know, I would submit that if you come to a priest and he really doesn't know much about spiritual theology, you, you might want to find somebody else to be a spiritual director. And Francis de Sales warns about that, as well as St. John of the Cross. So uh, those would be four things I'd recommend. But uh, Thomas Dubé in that book, Biblical theology of discernment. He talks about the fact that those who have been the greatest mystics of the, of the church were the most reluctant to talk about their experiences. One of the things John of the Cross says, do you want to know whether or not you had an authentic experience in prayer? Here's how you know. If you started telling other people about it, it wasn't authentic. It was just something that you conjured up. He says, if you go around telling other people, it's not a good sign. Because with that kind of gift would come the gift of humility. Right? So, I would highly recommend the book by Thomas Dubé. But those are some, some guidelines. Thomas Dubé, D-U-B-A-Y, I believe. And the book is called Authenticity. It's published by Ignatius Press. It's a fantastic resource. Any other questions? Yes. How did the mysteries come to be about in the resurrection? Over a long period of time. And I, I don't have time to get into it. There have been books written on this. And actually there's a, a bit of mystery to it. Because it's a little hard to trace out the exact time. The exact moment that the beads were used for the particular mysteries of the rosary. Um, so there's a little bit of de a debate among historians there. So um, I can't trace it all out. And I don't remember all the dates in my head. So I'm so sorry I can't tell you more. Oh, the luminous mysteries are described in John Paul II's letter on the mystery, uh, on, on the rosary. And I highly recommend it because he actually describes in the luminous mysteries what it is we should be talking about and thinking about, uh, meditating on. So, for example, the third luminous mystery is the proclamation of the kingdom. What are you thinking about then? He specifically directs us to Jesus' call to repentance. And in particular, healings like the healing of the paralytic who's paralyzed. And Jesus says, son, my son, your sins are forgiven. So it gives you a little bit more detail on, on what to meditate there. That was controversial when it came out because some religious communities, their whole life is structured around praying the entire rosary. And, it, you know, it was, it's difficult to say all three, the, the, you know, the joyful, the sorrowful, and the glorious in a day. John Paul II came running at it another 
upset. And so for some religious communities, it was a little bit of an inconvenience. But uh, it's called the letter, of, the letter on the Rosary. Yeah. And it's right there on the handout. Thank you so much. If you are interested in you know, learning more about my work, I do have my website at the top of the page, thesacredpage.com. I write that website with John Bergsma and Brant Petrie. We do commentaries on the Sunday readings, talk about news and biblical archaeology and so many other things. So I hope to see you online, and I'll be speaking again tomorrow morning. I'm especially excited about that talk. It's one I've never given before, and I've got a few things to share that um, I'm really excited to talk about. I don't I think they might be new. So uh, I'm not new in the sense of like new doctrine, but um, there are some texts that maybe haven't received too much attention in the past. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it.